Hey, I'm Mark. Let's go. Let's go. Get in here. Summer's over. We got stuff to do. Let's go to work. What? Oh, jeez. Okay, your IQ is hanging out about room temperature, and right now I'm looking for a sweater. Let's go. Sit down. Close the door. Why? Because I'm a history teacher, and I'm going rogue. You know, why is it that the first song a bagpiper learns is Amazing Grace? I mean, I guess I shouldn't kid. I mean, what's more moving than a New York City police honor guard marching down the street honoring a fallen hero with bagpipes playing Amazing Grace? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. One of the greatest lines in Christendom. Opening of one of, if not, the most beloved hymns of the church. And that's capital C. Because it cuts across denominational differences. See, Christians might not be able to agree on whether they should drink wine or juice with communion, or it sh whether it should be leavened or unleavened bread, or if baptism should be by sprinkling or by dunking, or if they should have services on Sunday or Saturday, or if Jesus was right-handed or left-handed. Like I said before, people, man, if God gives us something good, we got to find a way to screw it all up. But I digress. Amazing grace. All those denominations with such wide differences, they all know amazing grace. I mean, unless your pastor likens himself to Justin Bieber or something, and you know who you are. It's like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's like Father, Son, God rocks! But amazing grace. It encompasses the entire gospel in four short stanzas. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Are there any more powerful words that can be spoken by a human tongue? Hmm, I doubt it. But let's look at the story behind Amazing Grace and the man that wrote it, John Newton. Let's go rogue. Between 1550 and 1850, about 20 million people were forcibly removed from the continent of Africa to the Americas, enslaved to work on the fields in American plantations. Here in the United States, we think about plantation agriculture, we think of the cotton fields of the era before the Civil War. Not that I would ever want to be enslaved in any way, shape, or form, but if I had to choose, and slaves had no choice, the slavery in the sugar plantations of the Caribbean and South America was much more brutal than that of the American South. See, in the American South, slaves had a chance. In the sugar plantations, life expectancy, the age that the average slave died, was about 35. And because men died at an early age in slavery in the sugar plantations, and because most of those working in the sugar plantations were men, the plantation owners needed a continual flow of African slaves into the Caribbean islands and Brazil. European governments were more than happy to allow ships flying their flags to trade for slaves on the coast of West Africa and transport a cargo to America. During the 1500s, early 1600s, it was a free-for-all. But by the 1700s, most of the trade had fallen into the hands of the British. But there were those in Britain whose religious convictions drove their opposition to the slave trade. The most important opposition group was appropriately named the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade, which had several prominent members. Thomas Clarkson was a prolific propagandist that brought the horrors of the slave trade into the living room of every Londoner. Olauda Ekiano wrote and spoke about his experiences being enslaved in Africa, sold in Virginia, bought by a ship's captain and given his freedom in England. The most prominent member of the group was William Wilberforce, a member of parliament who for 22 straight years introduced the first bill of each session of parliament. The same bill with the same wording, a bill to abolish the slave trade. The movement of slaves from Africa to the Americas was referred to as the Middle Passage, the second leg of a voyage that had cheap manufactured goods moving from Europe to Africa in exchange for slaves moving from Africa to America and raw materials moving from America to Europe. One can imagine how horrific the Middle Passage was. Thomas Fole Buxton, in a speech to Parliament in support of Wilberforce's bill, stated, They're lodging below deck. 
are sometimes more than five feet high and sometimes less. And this height is divided towards the middle. For the slaves are in two rows, one above the other, on each side of the ship, close to each other, like books on a shelf. I have known them so close that the shelf would not easily contain one more. Thomas Trotter, a physician on a slaver, told a committee of parliament that it is the duty of the first mate to see them stowed. Every morning, those that do not get quickly into their place are compelled by the whip. I've seen their breasts heaving and observed them draw their breath with all of the laborious and anxious efforts of the life which we observe in expiring animals subjected to experiments to bad air of various kinds. A member of a slaver's crew, interviewed by Thomas Clarkson, related the misery which the slaves endure in consequence of too close a stowage is not easy to describe. I have heard them frequently complaining of heat and have seen them fainting, almost dying, for want of water. Mortality rates in the Middle Passage over the history of the transatlantic slave trade was between 15 and 20 percent. Slaves that had died were unceremoniously thrown overboard. It was said that the easiest way to find a slaver was to find the ship that was being followed by sharks. The confined space that slaves were packed in led to the potential of disease sweeping through the cargo. The most common was ophthalmia, a disease of the eyes that led to blindness and eventual death. Slavers faced a dilemma when a highly communicable disease was discovered. To keep a sick slave below deck would allow disease to spread through the entire cargo hold. The only way to stop the spread of a disease was to throw the slave overboard, alive if necessary. Members of the crew that interacted with infected slaves were subject as well. One account had the entire cargo and crew of a slaver blinded by ophthalmia. Hearing the ship in the distance, they hailed another ship and asked for help. The crew of that ship replied that they would like to, but they couldn't, because their entire crew was blinded by ophthalmia as well. One of the ships was saved. The other was never heard from again, sailing blindly around the ocean until the last person expired. One British captain that engaged in the slave trade was John Newton. Newton was a devout Christian who actually held Sunday services on the deck of his ship, preaching the gospel from his own pulpit and offering communion to his crew. All while enslaved Africans suffered below deck. He made five trips from Liverpool to the West African coast to America and back to Liverpool. And in 1754, he had a seizure that left, and he left the slave shipping. He took a job in Liverpool, still working in the slaving business, but then had a change of heart. Regretting the role that he'd played in the slave trade, he wrote, it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in my business, at which my heart now shudders. Seeking penance for his lifetime of slaving, he entered the Anglican priesthood and was appointed rector at St. Mary Woolnoth Church, where he met and tutored the young William Wilberforce. Newton lost his sight, perhaps from ophthalmia, and sat down, remembering, regretting his career, the hundreds that died in his carriage and thousands that died enslaved on the islands to which he had delivered them. In his own darkness, he could hear his captives below deck, no crying, no shouting, just a rhythmic, low moan. <laughs> Newton put pen to paper the best he could, putting the notes together, the low moan of the condemned. <laughs> In his own darkness, as ophthalmia and age slowly take his life, I mean, who was he to be allowed heaven upon his own death? He had mocked the very faith that he professed to hold dear. The tune haunted him. Then he put words to the tune. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved a wretch like me. See, if you're a Christian, it doesn't matter what you've done. All you have to do is believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is enough to save you from your sins. Even if your sin was delivering thousands of people into slavery and certain death. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. In 1807, William Wilberforce introduced the first bill of the parliamentary system, just as he had done in the previous 22 years, a bill to abolish the slave trade. This time, Parliament passed Wilberforce's bill. 1807 would be the year that the slave trade would finally be abolished. John Newton died in December the same year, living just long enough to see his country abolish the infernal trade that he once embraced. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Hey, I want to thank you for stopping by and spending time with me. I want to thank my new producer, Casey Moulton, AP World History 2018. I also want to thank Mr. Brent Allen for letting me borrow his studio up here on the campus of Columbia High School. I hope you got a laugh. I hope you learned something. If I did it right, you did both. Hit that like button if you did. Subscribe if you haven't yet. And I know who you are. Leave a comment below. I hope you had fun. I sure did. But I won't quit my day job. And I hope to see you again real soon. I'm Mark Haggard. I'm a history teacher. And I've gone rogue. Hey, what'd you get on the AP test? A four? That's awesome. I mean, not quite Princeton, but it's still awesome. <laughs>